Welcome once again to another wonderful time in God's wonderful presence. This is the gracious church, the place where so much grace abounds. And remember the Bible says we are what we are by the grace of God. So the grace of God is coming to you this morning through this medium, through this telecast. My name is Kao Dadi Shagam, your host. And this is the service to start. I'll be taking an opening prayer after which one of the ministers will come up and take a Bible reading, and then I'll be back to take the main service. Now, don't assume it's another telecast. It's a different one today. God is reaching you in a different way, addressing your situations in a different mannerism, and I want to assure you at the end of this meeting, your life will not be the same again. Once again, welcome to Overwhelming and Abundant Grace. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you for a time like this. This is the day you have made, Father. We will rejoice and be glad in this day. I ask and I pray on this occasion that everyone out there will experience a unique touch from you. You will reach out to them through the ministration of the word. You will address issues, questions, crises, and challenges in their lives. At the end of this meeting, they will have every reason to acknowledge that they have encountered God and their lives will not be the same again. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Now, once again, we'll go into a session, which is a Bible reading, which is just to prepare you for the main message. And then I will be back to bring the word of the Lord to you. Stay back and don't go away. God bless you. We'll be right back. Welcome back once again. It's time for Bible reading. And I'll be taking my Bible reading from a few scriptures. And first, let's go to Acts 10. I'll read from verse 3 to 6. And it says, this is talking about Colinius. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, and when he looked, and saying unto him, Colinius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy hams are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon, a tainer, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou ought to do. Again, I go to Matthew 26. Let's go to Matthew 26. I read from verse 7 to 13. And there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head, and he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she had brought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you. Let me jump to, jump to verse 13. It says, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman had done be told for a memorial of her. But in the Luke version, it, it says that um, thy sins which are many, or our sins which are many, are already forgiven. Let's go again to 1 Kings 17. From 12 to 14. And it says, and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal. This is talking about the widow of Zarephath and Elijah in a barrel. I start from 12 again. And she said, As, thy, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make for me thereof a little cake first. And bring it to me, and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Lastly, let's look at um, Luke 7. I read from verse 4 to 7. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, that it was worthy for whom he should do this. Now he's talking about the centurion whose servant was sick. For he loveth our nation, and he had built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now 
not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Whereof neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in the word, and my servant shall be healed. I jump to verse 10. And they that were, and they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant all that had been sick. Now, what am I trying to bring out of this reading? There are principles in the word of God where to get a particular thing, you must go this direction. For example, it says if you want to be forgiving, you, for, uh, you forgive other people, then you ask God for forgiveness. Also, there are also other principles, you know, for healing. Jesus Christ said those that um, behold need not a physician. So he's acknowledging that some people that are sick may need to use medicine. But God also is saying that there's a principle that can work out every other principle. And um, sorry that I'm coming back to the issue of giving. No matter how bastardized it is, if you look at in Acts, giving worked out salvation for Colinius. If you look in Matthew 26, the one we just read, it worked out forgiveness for the woman with the alabaster box of ointment. Now, in 1 Kings with the widow of Zarephath, it worked out prosperity. Now, if you look at in the Luke, the centurion, it worked out healing. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 7, um, 37, I don't want to go into the verse, it's saying that God gives the seed a body. What it means is, is God that decides what the seed will do. So God can decide to use a seed for healing. He can decide to use it for prosperity. He can decide to use it for forgiveness. So healing, as bad or as bastardized as it is giving, is what God can use to do anything in any man's life. It's a very powerful operation in the word of God that can lead to anything. It can be used to sort out any challenge. So it's just a word of encouragement for you to know that giving works. The most important thing is for you to know who to give to, what to give, and when to give. But trust me, I'm here to confirm to you again to say that giving works and is a very strong principle in the word of God. Thank you. Welcome back. And um, truly, giving is powerful and God gave is only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life is the greatest giver and i don't think anyone can outgive him and i believe giving is of god is by god for god and unto god amen um we thank god for that bible reading i'm back to the message of the day and interestingly, I'm not really preaching. I'm not preaching today. I'm discussing and I'm pouring out my heart as I can assess from the mind of God. I call it Nigeria, a ship lost at sea. A ship that is lost at sea. And um, I'm sure everyone agrees with me that the current Nigeria we see is not the Nigeria of our dreams. It's not what we envisaged. It's not what we planned for. It's not what we prayed about. But I have good news for you. God says that the time for Nigeria to be glorified has come. And God also says that it's time for Nigeria to move into its prophetic destiny. Um, first, let me say something. Three nations in this earth are very, very important to God. Number one, the United States is important. And whoever heads that country is very crucial. Satan will fight for the life of that country. Why? It is the executor of God's word. Israel is very important. Why? It is the pointer and the calendar of God's word. And Nigeria is very crucial. Why? It is the joker of God's word. It's God's final joker to humanity. And that's why Nigeria. And whoever leads these countries is very instrumental and very important in the calendar of God. And I'll tell you why. Leadership is crucial in the book of Ecclesiastes. It said, I have seen princes, noble men, walk on the ground while their own servants 
are on horses. It's not a humility practiced by the princes. It's an error from leadership. And so when a nation has the right leadership, it moves into the prophetic destiny of God. When it has the wrong leadership, it moves away from the prophetic destiny of God. And we could see that in the Bible when King Saul became the leader and the king of Israel. He is just strayed away from the prophetic destiny of God. Move far away. But when David took over the reins of leadership, Israel found its way back into the prophetic destiny of God. Now, um, first and foremost, that's why I said it's not a preaching. It's a discussion. Um, there's something I want you to know. Um, first, I want to talk about, before I come to the visions, I'll talk about leadership. Now, every leader comes with a measure of grace that affects how God will relate with that country. And um, in the time of Israel, when David was king over Israel, Israel fought wars from the day David became king to the day David died. They never knew one day of rest in the entire calendar of Israel. Now, if you look at most of the Psalms of David, he said, the Lord has taught my hands to bend a bow of steel. He has made my hands strong in war. It's all about war, war, war. Now, if you're a nation that God wants to give peace to, he tells you, vote for Solomon, not David. Now, if you vote for David, that peace will be delayed. And that war will come on. And that nation will go to war. Because the grace on David is war not peace. Now, interestingly, he won every war, but no one had a time of peace. So it wasn't really much of a time of prosperity because a nation doesn't prosper much in peace, in, in war. Nations prosper in the time of peace. Now, with all the killings in our country, it tells you automatically Nigeria is not really prospering. Now, Solomon is a man of peace. There was no record of one single war in his tenure. Now, if you want peace, you put Solomon there. So if God says now Israel is moving from war to peace, he puts Solomon in charge. Now, there is no provocation that will come for war. And if any provocation comes, he will solve it by wisdom, not by war. In the time of David, if any provocation comes, you saw how in the time of David, one man just didn't give him uh, money. They call him neighbor. Just didn't give him money. He already armed the soldiers coming for war. That is his nature. He will resolve all crises by war. And Solomon, if there is any crisis, there was a crisis, one of his brothers asked, he resolved all crises by wisdom. And that was why when two prostitutes had two children, one died and they came to him, he resolved it by wisdom. Why? He's a man of peace. The grace on his life is peace. Now, there's a Pharaoh in the time of Moses. And God said in Proverbs 9, eh, sorry, Romans 9, he said, Pharaoh, for this cause, I raised you up. Why? The grace on your life is judgment. I need Egypt to be judged for the wrongs it has done to my people. Now, without that Pharaoh being ruler of Egypt, Egypt will get away with the wrong they've done to the nation of Israel. They will just live without judgment. But that Pharaoh, the grace on his life is judgment. And God needed him there. So if the Egyptians did not vote for him and voted for another person who they believe is corrupt and they didn't want corruption, they would have escaped that ax. Their children would not have died. Their land would not have been destroyed. Though the children of Israel, in the calendar of God, it's time to move. They would have moved, but Israel would not have been judged. So you don't vote for a leader based on corruption. You vote for a leader based on grace. I remember a former president of Nigeria, um, um, General Yakubu Gowon, said once, he said, Nigeria's problem is not money, but how to spend it. Then he dawned on me. The purpose of the grace on his life was to settle quarrel and not economic prosperity. That's why they didn't give him economic wisdom. He had to get somebody who knows about economics to work with him 
And that was why he was the grace on him to preserve Nigeria from a breakup. Because God has a plan for Nigeria. And it will not work if Nigeria breaks up. And I prophesy Nigeria will not break up in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord assured me, and I'm making this categorical statement. He said Nigeria will not break up. Meaning something is going to happen that will tend us to want to break up. But we will not break up. And so Gowon was able to maintain the unity of Nigeria. And that was a grace on his life. I look at past presidents who have come. I look at uh, former president Olusha Gomba Sanjo for That's why I titled this message, Nigeria, a ship lost at sea. And I notice that he's great. At this time, Nigeria was respected. Even now, Nigerians practicing 419 were not treated harshly. Every Nigerian was respected. There was a measure of dignity accorded Nigeria. That's the grace on his life. There was a respect given to Nigeria. But I noticed most of the things he tried to do with his position, he tried to put Nigeria on the Security Council, he couldn't do it. He got to walk off final about two or three times, he couldn't win it. He prepared the ground. And I noticed when he left, it was like a David. He had prepared the ground for whoever. Now, that's another mantle of fatherhood. They prepare for the children, put enough on the ground to make it easy for the children coming to have an easy ride. But most of the time, they don't make the achievement. But they build so much. If you notice, David did not build the temple. But he prepared for the temple such that when Solomon came, it was easy for him to build the temple. And I noticed that about him. I also noticed on um, Jonathan when he came, now his regime is believed, perceived, to be extremely corrupt. In his tenure, Nigeria never witnessed the prosperity it witnessed in its tenure. Nigeria became the fastest growing economy in Africa, about the third in the world. We won the Junior World Cup. In its tenure, Nigeria became not a member of the Security Council, the president of the Security Council. Meaning, there's something about the grace on that man's life. Anything he touches flourishes and prospers and moves forward whether corrupt or not. Now, our current president is believed to be a man of great integrity. The first time that was slightly endeared to him was when Jonathan, um, uh, sorry, not Jonathan, when Yaradua was sick and they interviewed him and said the proper thing is for his vice to be sworn in as acting president. I was shocked when he made that statement. I said, oh, you mean this man is this honorable? But when we check the trend in his life, in his military days, things were hard. And now things are hard. Forget about the price of crude oil. Forget about the pandemic. That's not what makes things hard. It is the grace that that leader brings to the table. If you notice before he was sworn in during the campaign, he kept saying, we'll jail all the corrupt people. We'll jail all the corrupt people. He didn't talk about we'll turn around the economy. He didn't talk about anything. He kept talking about throw people in prison. And it dawned on me, the grace on his life is judgment. And so Nigeria is going to be judged by God because that's the grace he has brought to the table. Hardship was very common in his days as a military head of state, which is also hardship. Now, you may say, is the economy, is the pandemic, it is this. No, it's the grace on the leader. Now, that doesn't mean he wants, if you notice, he did even want to increase the price of uh, petrol. And they had to tell him that, look, people are smuggling, he said, because of the poor. So, he said, people are smuggling uh, this and this. He said, he, he was thinking about the poor, he said, he doesn't want to increase the price of petrol. But they told him in economic terms. You will destroy the economy. You have to increase the price of control so that the downstream can be privatized and deregulated. So maybe he doesn't really want the poor 
to experience hardship. But it's not about a choice of what he wants. It's about the grace he has brought to the table. It's called hardship, pain, judgment. And that's why when you're voting for a leader, don't be deceived by the propaganda of corruption and fighting corruption. Find out the grace on that man. And then that will help you to know. And the purpose that God wants to achieve, then you know whether his grace is relevant for that nation or not. Now, back to um, that is leadership. Now, that's just to help you know why we're going through some of the things we're going through is the judgment that is causing the killings is a judgment that is causing all the chaos you are finding everywhere and the hardship. Now, first, now I want to go to um, visions and messages. I remember once, now this is nothing to be scared about, and I believe God has put him there at this time because it is time for Nigeria to be judged. If you had missed this and voted for somebody else who might be corrupt, we will continue in the prosperity again and delay the judgment. Now, um, some time ago, I've been involved in many ministries, prayer sessions, prayer ministries, who have been concerned very specifically for Nigeria. And remember once, when the prayer meeting, it was a women's meeting, I was fortunately to be there because I was assisting the person handling the organization. So being a male, I was, I was, I was there. And this, the prophecy came and said, Nigeria was seen as a massive ship, big ship, sailing on the sea. Then it entered into a storm. That storm was so much that it was absolutely impossible for that ship not to capsize. The ship almost capsided. It was close, but it scaled through that storm. Now, there is a storm coming. We are now about to begin the storm. And there's a turbulence coming. My goodness. None like this has happened in any nation. Now, but God is assuring us Nigeria will scale through that storm. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 9, I'm still coming back to visions and messages that have come, which we want to review. In 1 Kings chapter 19, I'll read 1 Kings chapter 19, I'll read from verse um, 17, and then I'll close at 18. It shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. Him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Verse 19. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Now, um, I'll leave that scripture there, then I come back to visions and messages. And um, in the last one, two, three months, there's barely a week I've not been undated about visions concerning Nigeria. And people ask me, something is about to happen. I said, yes, I know. Something is about to happen. I said, yes, I know. I said, something is about to happen. They keep seeing visions of something about to happen. And something truly is about to happen. I'm not talking of 2021. I mean 2020. Something is about to happen. Um, Nigeria, and um, I'll say this to the glory of God, I'll first start with one time um, just before Bakasi was ceded to Cameroon, 
I was in a vision, and in that vision, I was by groove palms. And I saw a hurt in the middle of a groove palm outside of the city. And I saw a French lady, and I saw some French officials discussing with some military men and talking about Bakasi. And the Lord said, it's an international conspiracy against Nigeria. The Bakasi is going to be lost through an international conspiracy against Nigeria. And I remember then I went to share it with my pastor and I told him this is coming. And it came to pass about six months later, Nigeria lost Bakasi, but it's an international conspiracy against Nigeria. Now the message is coming. Now let me um, leave a lot of the messages coming because of time and stay with what is on ground. Now, the judgment of Nigeria is about to, cook, begin, to begin. Now, there are three swords mentioned in that scripture, the sword of Hazael. The sword of Hazael only took out a small group of illicit people. And the sword of Jehu took out mainly the house of Ahab, and a group of people too, while the sword of Elisha also took out more and the church. So the judgment is in threefold. The church, and let me back up again to visions, and this has been going on. People have been saying this. Everybody have been hearing it. God says that the church is to be judged. And actually, this pandemic is saving the church from his judgment commencing and is giving people time not to quickly open the church but to quickly be part of those who have not kissed the feet of Baal and those who have kissed the feet of Baal to quickly address the situation. That's what the pandemic actually, it's a sword that has taken as the first sword of Hazael. It has landed and it is taking not too many. It's taking the sword of Hazael is a caution it's a preamble and a warning. So it's taking a group of people and it's warning for people to sit back and say, the second sword is coming. Don't, those of you who have kissed the feet of Baal, corrupt people, debased people, enemies of Nigeria, enemies of Jesus, address your circumstance quickly. And it's not to rush to open the church, it's to rush to restitute to repent and readdress, restructure and realign yourself because the next sword is about to come. I call it the sword of the headsman, that this is majorly against the church of Jesus. It will look like the gate of hell has overrun the church, but the word of the Lord will never fail. It will never fall to the ground. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against, but it will look like the gates of hell has prevailed against it. The headsman, backed by Miyeti Allah, is preparing a genocide against the church and against a lot of people. They are planning it. People are not aware. They're going around. God knows. And that's why he's warning people. He's showing visions and warning. These people are coming with the jihad. They are coming. Buckle up and brace up for it. And God is simply saying to prepare for it, take a step of faith. Why take a step of faith? Now, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says we are protected. We are preserved by the power of God through faith. Only the power of God will save people. The angels of God will descend to save his own. These people are armed to the teeth, well prepared, properly backed up, well aligned, well stationed, well spread, well financed, organized to the teeth. You know, Satan is an organizer. If you look at it, he says, and the kingdom of Satan has wicked spirits in heavenly places, principalities, powers, rulers, well structured, well organized. And the church is going on as if they don't even realize something is about to happen. That sword is about to be unleashed against the church. 
The reason why they have not moved is because the pandemic has slowed them down. The church is closed. And rather than the leadership of the church to begin to prepare people by getting them to pray and take steps of faith, they're clamoring for the opening of the church because they can't see the disaster that is laying waste at noonday at their doorstep. But I'm bringing this message not to scare you, but to warn you as Christians, prepare and brace up. It cannot be avoided, it cannot be averted, but it can be controlled. And pray, those of you living in sin, turn away from, that's a very unpopular message now, but turn away from your evil ways. Embrace Jesus, that's not enough. Take a step of faith. The fact that you embrace Jesus is not enough and a guarantee. You must take it. The Bible says it was written of Simeon that he shall not taste death until he has seen Jesus. That prophetic word is what will keep you and all through that period. And we're praying that times will be shortened for the elect's sake. When that happens, then the final sword will come. I will not tell you which people will bring it, but they are not very many. They're a group of people. They will move with that sword, an angelic host will descend from heaven. And they will finally put a clincher to all this mess. And all the corruption will be dealt with. All the fake pastors will be dealt with. All the fake churches will be judged and dealt with. All the politicians, enemies of Nigeria who have plundered these nations, they'll be dealt with. All those who have no business in leadership will be dealt with. All those who have turned to gods in the political cycle that have been worshipped. The gods all over the place, you know them. Gods that bring bullion vans into their company. God said their bodies will be carcasses, eaten by vultures. They will not be buried. They will be dealt with. And all the political godfathers that have held Nigeria captive, they will all be dealt with. It's coming, and it's coming very, very soon. Nigeria is just minutes from the storm. The storm is about to begin. When this man correct this mess, people will see angels by their side moving to put an end to the final sword that will be released by God. And then Nigeria will be known for righteousness. Nigeria will be known for holiness. And nations of the earth will be talking. Niger America won't be where people want to go. Everyone will want to come to Nigeria. The green passport will be more costly than gold. It will be the desire of nations. And people will be discussing. While instead of discussing pandemic and football, is it true I hear in your nation that this is happening and that is happening? And people who are sick will be boarding flights. Instead of the uh, health tourism going to India, people who are sick will be boarding flights and airports will be jammed, bringing them into Nigeria. The glory of God will rise over Nigeria as never seen upon a nation before. But the storm will bring genocide. It will bring a genocide that will make the Rwandan genocides. I will not talk, I don't want to scare you. But God will control it. Nigeria will not break up. Nigeria will not disintegrate into war. Let me make it categorical. There will be no war. There will be, skip, well, we see skirmishes of uprising, Boko Haram, headsmen, kidnapping, ritualists, and all that stuff. Yeah, it might degenerate worse, but there will be no war. There will be no breakup. When the new Nigeria emerges, it will not be said that I am Yoruba, I am Fulani, I am Igbo, I am Hausa, I am Ijo. It will be said I am a Nigerian. And the true nation will be birth. The true identity of one nation, one tongue, one people will arise. And like the prophecy of Pa Elton will not come to pass. It's going to start coming to pass from this year, not next year, this year. Right now, we're known for corruption. But we're about to be known for righteousness. Amen. Um, I don't want to talk much 
about the swords. Um, I would have spoken more about the swords, what they will do, who they will address. But I've said one thing, Mieti Allah is part of that sword. The headsmen are part of that sword. And the victims are the church. And um, they too will be judged. And God will demand for the blood of his children. Jesus will fight back from heaven. He will defend his own. He will fight with the sword of his mouth. He will intervene and he will resolve the issues himself. EFCC is not going to resolve the issue of corruption. Jesus will step in and resolve that issue himself. Praise the Lord. Um, I will not want to say much more than that. I would like to stop there. Though there is so much for me to say. But you know wisdom will advise me not to say much more. I also will not want to give details of the third sword that is coming. Um, but I want you to know that uh, we're in the most crucial time of the existence of Nigeria ever since it was created. There's never been such a time as this. And there will never be any time like this again. And I want to encourage everyone out there that is doing something right, keep doing something right. Um, evil will not continue to flourish. The time to reward righteousness is here. It looks like the bad guys are having their way and the good ones are fools, but that is about to be reversed. God is going to step in and he will reward the good guys and he will prove that evil, corruption, and all it's like have no part but in judgment of fire which will happen to them. Amen. I also want you to know there's the enemies of Nigeria that will be judged. Those who are playing the drums of war, they will be consumed in the music they are playing in the name of Jesus. I also want you to know God has no favoritism with any tongue or any tribe. God is not a tribal, neither is he a regional God. God loves everyone. Amen? I also want you to know that this is a message against the enemies of the church and the enemies of Nigeria. Praise the Lord. I will not say more than that again, like I said earlier on. I'll leave it. But I'm warning you, take a step of faith. Take a step of faith and save your life and save your lineage and save your children both born and unborn. What is coming is beyond what the natural mind can comprehend and has answer to. Amen. I'll take a break for just one minute and I'll be back. Not about Nigeria this time, but about the kingdom of God that is already on ground. Just a minute and I'll be right back. Don't go away. I can't say more than what I want to say. I cannot. <clears throat> I cannot. It's not advisable, Abby. Eh? As, yeah, no, there's more, but I shouldn't say more than. Let's go. <laughs> Welcome back and. That about Nigeria, of course, is not to scare you. It's just to let you know and reassure you, no matter what you see, the glory of Nigeria has arrived. The beauty of Nigeria has come. And that prophetic, beautiful, prophetic word has come. Honestly, um, if anyone has dual citizenship and is to choose one with what God is about to do, you should choose Nigeria and ditch any other passport, be it American, Canadian, or UK. That's a personal opinion. That's not the word of God. 
Excuse me. Amen. Now, the kingdom of God has come. And the Bible says in the last days, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations of the world. Now, it didn't say everyone will receive the kingdom. It didn't say everyone will believe. It didn't say everyone will accept. It just said it will be preached. So there is responsibility of the ch on the church to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And of course, Jesus said, when the end is about to come, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be um, pestilences. Then the last thing he said, then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And the next word he said, then the end will come. So it is the last thing that will be displayed just before the end. Now, if I'm preaching the gospel of the kingdom now, it means the end, not is near, it has come. Now, uh, you may say, oh, I don't want to hear it. No, it didn't say you hear it. It said it will be preached. Whether you hear it or not, it will be preached, and which is what I'm preaching. So the end is near. And um, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God that rules over all kingdoms. And you know, the disciples asked the Lord, he said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Everybody was talking about the kingdom, awaiting the kingdom of God. You know, men of those days were awaiting the kingdom. Now, people are not even aware the kingdom has arrived. If it has arrived, then where is it? What is it? How can I assess it? These are questions people are asking. First and foremost, the kingdom of God is not a building. I remember, uh, I can remember the year, a few years back, no, not a few years, many years back, there was a bomb blast at the army cantonment at Ikeja. And when the bomb went up, or missiles going up into the air, there's a lot of pandon, pandon, uh, pandonium, or, you know, a lot of confusion. And people were running elter scattered, trying to find where to hide so that you don't get injured. And so many ran to churches, thinking they'll be safe there. That church can be brought down with a bomb. Is it not ordinary coronavirus that has shut down churches? Then it means the kingdom of God is not a church. Because the kingdom of God cannot be crushed, cannot be subdued, cannot be shut down, cannot be capped. The government of the nations of the world cannot hold it. It will crush any government. In, in, in the book of Daniel, Daniel had a dream. And he said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the greatest king on earth. I saw you in a vision. I saw this golden statue. The head was made of gold, the chest of silver, the, the, the tire of bronze, the leg of iron, and then maybe iron and clay mixed together. And I saw a stone carved without hands. It smashed that statue to the end. And that stone carved without hands was described as the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God cannot be stopped. The pandemic has stopped the church, not the kingdom. And the kingdom is not a structure. And so when they were running Elta Skelter from the bomb, they should have run to the kingdom of God, but they were running to buildings. And some buildings came down, and there were churches. Right now, many churches, in fact, all churches are short. And men are clamoring for the reopening of the churches. But you can't clamor for a reopening of the kingdom because you can't shut the kingdom. And many of them do not have the kingdom. And that's why they need the church to open very quickly so that they can gain some form of relevance. So the kingdom of God is not a building. It's not the church. It's not a denomination. You know, men pride now in denominations with so many branches. Coronavirus that we can't see with the ordinary eye shut all the denominations and all the branches down. That shows how very feeble they are. 
It is a set of rules, which I will simply put, is the rule of God through principles, doctrines, operations, ideologies. You know, if you look at the ideology with the extremists, that's um, ISIL, they've defeated ISIL as an institution, but they've not defeated the ideology. They've defeated Al-Qaeda as an institution, they've not defeated the ideology. They've defeated, appreciably, I trust, I pray, Boko Haram is getting weaker, but they're yet to defeat the ideology. And so, the kingdom of God is the rule of God through these mechanisms. Um, it could compose of principles, themes, theories that are believed, that work, and guaranteed never to fail. It is likened to faith, a triumphant faith that can subdue anything under heaven. When Joshua spoke to the sun and the moon to be still, that is the kingdom of God in operation. He can remove a government. He can install a government. He can subdue a nation. He can save a nation. The Bible says Israel was preserved by the grace of Moses. That grace is a kingdom. It crushed the entire nation of Egypt, impoverished it, and subdued its entire army. Just one rod. Not a building, an ordinary rod, turned the most powerful nation into a beggar and crushed them. That is the kingdom of God that is now on ground, though people are yet to see it. It is powerful, lethal, deadly. It cannot fail, it has never failed, and can never fail. Now, um, Talking about the kingdom, there are a few things. I'm still going to come to the teaching about the kingdom, its mechanism, its operation. But I just want to give you a few hints of what the kingdom entails. So that when I'm teaching, you'll be able to come along with me and understand what I'm trying to say. So a king is a ruler over a domain or a territory. And the kingdom has towards the king and the domain. So it's a king and a domain. Now, the Bible says all Christians are supposed to be kings and priests in Christ Jesus, but they have no domain yet, and they have no scepter to rule. So, they are kings in waiting. Now, the kingdom is a king who has taken his scepter and has been given his domain and has been given the instrument to rule with. Now, that territory could differ from one aspect to the other. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 10, it says, We're kings and priests unto God. That's why Jesus is referred as the king of kings, not the king of impotent kings, the king of kingdom kings and the lord of lords. Lords are small g gods. That's why God told Moses, I've made you a god to Pharaoh. So kingdom has at his domain gods. Amen. Now, we are supposed to operate in the realm of the gods. In Psalm 82, I read Psalm 82. And then I read verse 1. Um... Psalm 82, verse 1. God, or another translation says, Elohim, stand in the congregation of the mighty. He judged among, another translation says, the Elohims. So, God, Elohim, stand in the congregation of the mighty, and he judged amongst the Elohims. So, 
God is standing in the congregation. Now, in Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says, I will stand in the congregation. So we're all supposed to be Elohims. Each of us has a domain. <coughs> Excuse me. Each of us, <coughs> each of us has a domain that has been carved out to us from, from God that we're supposed to be gods over, rulers over, which is the kingdom of God that is given to us. Colossians 1.23 Paul said, a portion of the word of God has been given unto me to fulfill the mandate of God. That portion, which is the word of God, is also the kingdom of God, which has been distributed to all Christians. Now, all Christians are priests, but not all Christians can approach the throne of God because priests approach the throne of God and make supplications on behalf of people. That's why in people who see herbalists, they go to meet them, they consult their deities. So the priest is to consult God, not the Almighty just like that, but consult the operation of God in the area of their kingdom and get solution for people. So in the real sense of it, the church is also being judged in Nigeria because it is the solution giver to the situation on ground, but it has become this problem complicator to the situation on ground. That's part of why it is being judged. I said, there's so many things I don't want to say. I saw a vision and, oh Jesus, let's not even talk about the leadership of the church. Let's leave that. Praise the Lord. So, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 11 to 13, David was anointed as king over Israel and Judah. But the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11, David began to reign first partially in Judah for seven years, then in Israel after seven years. So he took Ram as ruler. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 16, he was anointed as king. So he is a king in waiting, like many Christians are kings in waiting. But in 2 Samuel chapter 2, he began to reign. And that's why the Bible says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. Now they're not reigning. Now the kingdom has arrived. And God says, if you don't complete your task and take over the rulership, it will be taken away from Nigeria and given to another nation that is ready and willing to take it. So the current church on ground is derailing people from the kingdom and not allowing them to access the kingdom. And that's why God said the leadership of the church too will be judged. I said I won't talk about this issue again. I don't know why I'm going back to it, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Praise the Lord. It's sad. That we have so many churches, yet toothless and powerless. Not one has been able to raise a dead person. It's all schemes. Now, David first reigned in Judah for seven years. And after seven years, he combined Israel. So a person may reign in one aspect of domain for some time, and then take over another domain that somebody has refused to take over and add to his domain and be ruler over two domains. So instead of being king over just Judah, he'll be king over Judah and Israel, which could mean different things in today's world. So David did not just start to reign when he was anointed by Samuel, but years later when he was tested and proven. In Hebrews 1.8, it says the scepter. What is the scepter? I'm still giving um, introductory about the kingdom. I've not started talking about the kingdom. I'm just giving you all these highlights so that when I begin to talk about the kingdom, you will have an idea of what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. Now, in Hebrews 1.8, it talks about the scepter, which is a symbolic ornamental staff. For many of you watch African magic or you watch um, traditional rulers, especially in Nigeria, you always notice 
the Igwe or the king has a staff in his hand. He has one small horn he holds around. In biblical terms, they call it scepter. It's an ornamental staff, but it's not a ceremonial staff. It's an anointed staff. The staff Moses held was not ceremonial. The ones we have is ceremonial. When you have the one that is anointed, nations will bow. Nations, the one Moses had earlier was ceremonial. Nobody bowed to him. When he became anointed, the kingdom staff, the whole of Egypt, Jericho, nations of the world, did what? Tremble at his name. So it's an ornamental staff or a wand held in a hand by a ruling monarch as an item of royal or imperial power or status. God said to tell you, the scepter is already on ground. Pick it up. It's time for those who have passed the exams to pick it up. And some of you who are disturbed, you may be wondering, why am I disturbed? You are not picking your scepter. You have done all to stand. And it remains one thing to stand. Do that one thing and pick your scepter. Otherwise, time is running out. Somebody else will take it. And that's why some people are disturbed. As a Christian, some of you are disturbed. Your scepter is by your side. You need to pick it up. Amen. So it is an, a system and an expression of a divinely enabled gift and endowment which God expresses himself through. It is likened to many parameters in the Bible which I will not look at today. But remember one thing I said, it is not a place, it is not a church building, it is not a cathedral. In fact, you can have a cathedral with two million members and have no single kingdom there. And it's just ceremonial um, ornament in the hand of the Jew, ceremonial. It's like the rod that Moses held before. It's a status. The rod Moses held before was a status of magician in Egypt. That's what we have in most churches now. The one that is coming with the sons of God is imperial power. This one, the one Moses held before, they stayed in the palaces, but they can't do more than the first five, no, the first four plagues. The one Moses, the one the sons are coming with, they are in the wilderness, not in the cathedral, but they will bring all the ten plagues. So what we have on ground is the staff of the pre-anointed Moses, which is ceremonial, symbolic, fanfare, our daddy, our bio, our bishop, that's what we have, titles. What is coming is not title, it's power. Power that the ages and the eons spoke about but didn't comprehend and couldn't phantom the depth of it. The power of the ages to come, which is what we have now on ground, that is about to be unleashed simultaneously, both with the swords of Jehu, the sword of Elisha, and at the same time, the kingdom of God coming out in its full glory and power. Both are coming together. And of course, it's the kingdom that will empower the sword of Elisha to finally deal the devastating blow that will end everything. Amen. Uh, that sounds a bit technical. You may not understand that, but the Holy Spirit will help you. If I speak more than that, I could be tagged as, um, you know, they call it hate speech. You know, hate speech, the media last said they will scatter Nigeria. It's not hate speech. But if somebody is defending himself and is being attacked, they call it hate speech, you know? So that can be called hate speech. But it is well. All that is about to change. Amen. So in Luke 17, and I close with this, Luke 17 from verse 20. Luke 17 from verse, seven, from verse 20 to 21. And I read... When he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God shall come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. That means it's not something you can calculate that it is coming this way. No, 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 no. Neither shall they say, Lo, here 
or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. God says, I brought my kingdom to shield you from the sword of Bezalel, the sword of Jehu. I should think before that I may need to evacuate my family from what is coming. But I just understand from this message, it's an anointing, it's a grace that will protect everyone. I was asked the Lord, do I move my family out of this country? And he said, Noah's ark, there is nowhere you can escape the rain on the face of the earth. Noah's ark, it's an anointing that shielded Noah from the judgment and the anger and the fire of God that consumed the entire earth. That ark is not physical now. It is spiritual. It's a grace. It's an anointing. It's a peace. And as many as have received it, they can walk in the midst of the entire pandemic. The Bible says, and they took up Jesus to throw him over the cliff, but he just walked out in the midst of them. When this grace is upon you, no matter what is happening, you will walk out of it unscratched, untouched in Jesus' name. So it's an anointing. It's the kingdom. The Lord said it's beside each and every one of you. Open your eyes and assess it and take refuge in it before they unleash the heavens and open up the sky for what is hidden to fall onto the ground. Again, I'm back to the same thing I said I'm not going to talk about, and, but I, I just want to assure you that God is doing everything to save his own, to protect his own. He's the one that's caused all the delay from what wants to happen. He's trying to get you to be prepared, and God will help you out. And before I close, I just want to say a few prayers for Nigeria. Please pray for Nigeria in your personal time. We have no other nation after of this nation. It's our duty, it's our responsibility to make Nigeria great and habitable, conducive for our generation to come. And if anything happens, we'll be held responsible. We will not present a Nigeria where our generation and children unborn will not be able to survive. We'll present a Nigeria like David and what he did for Solomon, where it will be easy for them to make it in life. Oh, Father, we pray for this nation, Nigeria. We see what is coming. We ask, and you have told us, that there will be no war. We ask, according to Psalm 46, the sword, the spear, and the chariots used for war. Father, break the spear asunder, destroy the arrow and break it to pieces, and burn the chariots in the fire in the name of Jesus. In Psalm 46, he says, He bringeth wars to the end and causes to cease. And one of the ways he does that is that he destroys the weapons of war. In those days, it was the arrow, the spear, and the chariots. Father, men who have stockpiled weapons to unleash mayhem on your church. Father, destroy those weapons according to Psalm 46 in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Let those weapons turn against the people who have kept it to unleash mayhem. Like you did in the Bible, Lord, let them turn one against another in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the enemies of the church let their language be confused. Let them not be warned in the name of Jesus. The time of the unleashing of the sword, Father, shorten it. Let it not lengthen. Let it not even reach the time you have set. Reduce it. You set more time for David for the pestilence. You set three days of pestilence. When David called upon you, the pestilence ended the first day. <clears throat> Father, 
whatever days you have set for the unleashing of the sword, shorten it by one third, by two thirds. Let it not go beyond one third. You said you shorten the times for the elect sake. For your elect sake, shorten it. That it will be brief, it will be short in the name of Jesus. I also pray, a lie shall destroy the prophets of Baal and Astero. Let the sword be for those who are marked for the sword. Your own enemies, let it not take any innocent life. Let those who have no business be taken by the sword. Let them not be in the way of the sword on the day it goes out. On his day of his outing, keep those who are not sealed with death out of the way. And let it go for those for whom are to be judged. Men who have plunged Nigeria into mayhem, into chaos, into disaster, into poverty in the name of the Lord Jesus. All the money they have stolen, neither they nor their lineage will spend it in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray also concerning this nation. Fulfill every good word you have made. Let no good word of the Lord fall to the ground. Lord, fulfill it in your church in this nation. Lord, rejiggle the church. Give it a new life. Lord, replace as many have no business in the new dawn and the new horizon you have created. Remove them out of the way. I ask you open for the ones, your sons, whom you have put as custodians of this new glory. Open them up, O oh God. When they speak, honor their word. The allies who are to be removed, when they speak from now on, dishonor their word. Let their word fall to the ground. Let it not flourish. Let it not prosper. Those who have eaten at the table of Jezebel, Lord, let your angels not answer to them in the name of Jesus. The Samuels that you have raised, let not their word fall to the ground in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that that new Nigeria known for righteousness, Father, step in and help us to create it. Give us the new Nigeria. Like you said, behold, I make all things new. A new heaven and a new earth where there is no tribalism. There is no nepotism. There is no corruption. No killings. Senseless killings. Mindless killings. Lord, give us that new Nigeria in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray for our brethren in the north, especially in Kaduna, who are being used as a trial for what they want to do. They are using them as a trial to test the waters, to see how they will go about the rest. Father, intervene. Let them see that even in the trial, you will step in. Step in and save them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray at the end of it all, let Nigeria be filled with the knowledge of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ as the waters cover the sea. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I declare these prophecies over Nigeria. Nigeria will rise again. Nigeria will shine again. Nations will come to our light. Leaders of nations will come to the brightness of our rising. All our sons abroad and daughters, they will not be deported. Rather, they will come back with great treasures because God will glorify Nigeria in the mighty name of Jesus. There's a new horizon over Nigeria, a new dawn over Nigeria, and what God will do will make the ears of all the nations of the world to tingle in the name of Jesus. God is creating a new Nigeria that does not have all these old, irresponsible politicians who have plunged Nigeria into darkness. And in this new Nigeria, the old pains, the wars, the fightings, the corruptions, nepotism, tribalism, shall not be remembered again, neither will it come to mind. In the new Jerusalem, he says, the lion and the sheep will sit together and eat as brothers. 
In this new Nigeria, the Fulanis, the Yorubas, the Igbos will dwell together, the Jaws, the Awusas, as one entity in brotherly love in the name of Jesus. A new Nigeria is being birthed, is the doing of God. No one will add to it, no one will subtract from it. Whoever tries it is at his peril in the mighty name of Jesus. Finally, Nigeria will be known for righteousness in all the nations of the world. Everywhere we go, people will look at us as unique and special people, not corrupt people. They will see us as a people of God. They will acknowledge us as a blessed nation in Jesus' mighty name. This will happen in my time. And it will go further in the times of our children and our children's children in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have not wished anyone any evil, but I have made one thing clear. Anyone who God has no plan in moving Nigeria forward, they are being removed in the mighty name of Jesus. Those who plan to retrogress Nigeria backwards, God is removing them in the name of our Lord Jesus. You can bring in arms. You will only use it for yourself. The legitimate arms is for our military. Who will use it to defend Nigeria? All those tribal groups bringing in arms, it shall not be used on innocent citizens. Rather, they will use it. Those using planning to use it to cause mayhem, they will rather use it on themselves in the name of Jesus. Nigeria is blessed, blessed forever in the name of our Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Now I am closing and I believe very strongly you've learned one or two things. I believe there are so many things I've said that is not new, which you have been seeing. So it's just reminding you and just letting you know that all what we have been discussing, the visions you have been seeing, we have, I can call it days for it to begin to manifest. And I want you to know when this is all over and the count is made, you will not be found wanting. Neither you or your loved ones will be missing. We will all gather again and rejoice and glorify God in Jesus' name. And I pray as the schools open, God will keep our children. He will protect them in schools. The pandemic, the plague will not come near them. It will not touch them. If their fathers have sinned, their fathers will die. They will not bear the sins of their father. God will protect all our children, including those in universities, uh, polytechnic, secondary school, primary school, crash. As they go to schools, the angels of God will escort them safely and bring them safely to their homes. No plague, no coronavirus will touch them in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we've come to the end of today's meeting. It's just a discussion, not really a preaching. But I believe you have been blessed. Have faith in God. Have faith in Nigeria. This nation will rise again. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Amen. And I take a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. I've given the little I can. There's so much I couldn't say. And you know why? Wisdom will not allow me to say more than that. Lest they call it hate speech. <laughs> but you will take the little I've spoken and expound it in the hearts of your people and give them light and direction concerning the things you are doing. So that in all that is going to happen, they will profit, they will excel, and you will be glorified in them in Jesus' name. I pray at our next time we'll meet again, every count here will still be standing. And not only standing, they'll be standing with testimonies of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your kindness, of your mercy, and your gracefulness. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. I'll just take the closing, the grace now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forevermore. 
Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 9, it says, And God has made all grace to abound towards us, and we always have all sufficiency in all things and at all times. We are bound unto every good work. Amen. God bless you.